Hey, everybody. Oh, look, people joining already. This is going to be a great one. I'm going to give you a few minutes to roll in. But hi, if you don't know me already, I'm Colin Campbell. I'm uh, the, I don't know, general manager, marketing guy, get it done in residence at Sales Hacker. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today and giving us some of your time. Today, we're talking about how to scale personalization efforts in, um, out in outbound prospecting. <clears throat> and I swallowed a frog right before, so that's why I found it sound funny. Um, we're going to get into some really specific examples, which is going to be fun. We're going to hear some stories from people who have done a lot of personalization at scale with like the little plays that work, that are creative, and how they innovate on those plays over time. We're also going to talk a little bit about how you set up systems and processes for scaling personalization. So you kind of always have this machine running and you don't have to do like stop start efforts. So um, while y'all filter in, I want to start by doing the boring webinar stuff as always. If you're new to Sales Hacker webinars, you know how I feel that you gave us an hour of your day today and you don't want to feel like you're watching a YouTube video. So go down to the bottom of the screen and click chat right now. And then when you see that little blue panelists button, make sure it says panelists and attendees. So you're talking to each other and introduce yourselves. Let us know who's here and we'll introduce ourselves as well. And I'm going to wait while you do it so we can give some shout outs. Uh, if you have questions, so you can feel free to get that chat going, uh, talk to each other, connect on LinkedIn, whatever you want to do. If you have questions for the panelists, go to the Q&A, just a different button down there, but I'll keep my eyes on that. So if you've got questions, I'll make sure we get answers for you. We got folks from Ottawa. Somebody's here from Personify, Lee and SDR manager of Personify. Bob in LA. We got somebody from the Netherlands, from DC, the UK, BC. Ooh, a bunch of Canadians today. Hello. Nova Scotia, Montreal, you're blowing me away, Knooks. Hey, everybody. Uh, did I like set up an ad for Canada? That's great. I knew Thanks it was a good day to wear a denim shirt. I knew it was a good day to wear a denim shirt. <laughs> That's right. Denim we'll, shirt is a perfect. We'll day. talk about sales process. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right, right. Um, all right, so let's do some introductions. Uh, let's start with you, Corey. So we've got some pretty amazing panelists here for you today. First of all, we've got Corey Kruger. He is the sales development manager at Tapalti. And if you don't mind, Corey, could you tell the crowd just a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Uh, so so um, I work at Tapalti. I'm the uh, outbound uh, uh, business development manager. Uh, just a little bit about Tapalti. We're an accounts payable automation solution. Uh, and uh, we you know, help organizations around the world um, uh, automate all those manual processes uh, that are involved with actually executing payments. Um, really lucky I've been there for about three and a half years uh, and helped uh, um, grow the organization. When, when I started, we were about five to 10 SDRs. We're over 50 SDRs now. And uh, six months ago, we got the illustrious unicorn title. So we're, we're a double unicorn. So very, very excited for that. And uh, like two days ago, we acquired our first company. So, so very exciting times here at uh, Tipalti. That's very exciting. I missed the news of the acquisition, but congrats. Thank you. Uh, so in addition to Corey and his amazing resume, we've also got Appy Chaudhary. Appy, I hope I said your last name right. Um, you're the head of sales development at Blend and a similarly impressive background. Can you tell the crowd here about it? Hi everyone, yeah, I'm Mappy. I lead the SDR team at Blend. Uh, I've been here for a year now. Blend is a digital lending platform. We basically sell to the top 1,000 financial institutions in the United States, including banks, credit unions, and independent mortgage banks. I've been over here for a year. Um, great SDR team, part of the marketing organization, work very closely with demand generation. Um, and uh, it's been an exciting time. In the last six months, we've raised our Series G and Series F funding. Our valuation went from 1.7 billion to 3.3 billion. Congrats. Uh, thank you. We've also recently just acquired a company called Title 365. Um, so really exciting times. Um, we're going to talk about outbound prospecting. Uh, my team has been focused on personalization, so excited for this conversation. Yeah, we're excited to have you. That's great news. Uh, I didn't realize you also had a recent acquisition. 
Uh, and by the way, Appy, Jeremy Ross is giving you a shout out. He says, he used to report to you, and he says, you're awesome. So thanks for being here, Jeremy. Um, John Stern is telling me I should. So I don't know if y'all saw, if you're in the chat, I said, the best question in the Q&A today uh, will get a sales hacker hoodie as chosen by we're, Corey, Appy, and Alex are going to pick the best question. Um, and John Stern said I should replace the hoodie with a denim shirt. It might get better questions. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good one. All right. So last but certainly not least, we've got Alex Miller with us. He's the Director of Revenue Operations at Sendoso. Uh, Alex, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and Sendoso? Surely. So uh, super excited to be here. I think my role is a little bit different than Corey and Appy's, but uh, how we prospect and you know, personalization is something that's super near and dear to my heart. It's what we do at Sendoso. So if you haven't heard of Sendoso, Sendoso helps companies engage, convert, retain customers with strategic sending and gifting. So lots of fun ways of uh, implementing personal mail and, and things like that into prospecting motions. Uh, a little bit about the company. We're just over 400 employees, mostly based here in the Bay Area or in our Scottsdale, Arizona office. I myself, I'm actually in San Francisco. Uh, in my role, though, I look after ops for our sales development department, which is about 30 plus strong out in Scottsdale, uh, but also our sales account management, customer success. Uh, pretty much anybody that touches their go-to-market cycle. Uh, so I've been there for just under two years now. Uh, way back when I started my career out it, as a sales development rep, the best way you possibly can. So personalization, despite having kind of disappeared into the background a bit, uh, has always been something that's super near and dear to me. So looking forward to jumping in today. Cool. Well, thanks for being here, everybody. Um, let's start off just so really briefly. I think everybody's familiar with the idea of personalization. Um, but... There are some times when I see efforts at personalization that really aren't personalized or something just hits, just hits weird. So, um, Corey, let's start with you. Can you just like give us a really brief example, something, or maybe not example, but what's your like idea? What is personalization? What is it not? How do you tell yeah. the difference? Yeah. So, so to me, uh, personalization is um, showing you or showing the, the prospect that you understand their world. Uh, whether it be, uh, you know, them personally, uh, the industry, the company, maybe their role. So, so really tailoring your message around that. Um, but, but when I think about personalization, I think that just kind of gets you um, the opportunity um, to be relevant, right? So that's where I think the, the link is, um, you know, mentioning something about, about their role, their company, whatever's going on, but then matching that with why is this outreach relevant to them? What can your product or service do that can really impact them in their role in the organization? So, um, you know, I, I see a lot of personalization where they're just like, hey, mentioning where they go to college or something like that. I think that's, that, that's good. That can be, you know, impactful, but that only gets you so far. What lands the meeting is really being relevant after that, that bit of personalization. Yeah, good points. Uh, Appy, anything to add on that point? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> personalization is the key, especially it's it's 2021, it's not 2005 where regular emails and cold calls would work. So you really, the initial 10 seconds, 15 seconds on a phone call or the, the two lines of your email need to grab the prospect's attention before you're, you get a not interested or please don't call me back again. Uh, it's the key, it's super important. Uh, without personalization, it's very difficult to be a successful outbound rep. Um, as much as possible, researching uh, the company, the prospect, uh, other than just sharing which college you went to, what problems they're facing, what pain points and what value you provide has become a key in getting and grabbing prospects at age. Yeah, it, that's a great point too. It really is about prospects expectations and what people have gotten used to i know for me i get a lot of cold email about people wanting to like buy links or submit content saleshacker.com and they all just reference like an article i wrote that i know they just kind of scraped off the site and it's like an autofill field from you know whatever tool they're using to send that email and you i don't even read the email you can tell at a glance when it's been written by a human or just put together by like in a template. Um, so my expectations I know as a prospect for that motion are like sky high. And I think that's happening in every industry. Um, Alex, I may have just stolen your thunder, but I feel like that's for me, at least that's why personalization is important. Why do you think it is 
important today or maybe more important today than it used to be? Oh, and I think you guys all nailed it. I think, yeah, you know, we think about personalization is just saying, hey, does this person like know our business? Uh, but also like, where does our business intersect with their business? I think it's really easy to kind of like, you know, say, hey, like you guys do this, like you should talk about this. But I think more specifically, it's saying like, hey, did this person do the legwork to try to understand, you know, my role, my company, what we do, how do we go to market, you know, who are our competitors, who are our contemporaries, who are our partners, things like that. Um, you know, but I think it's not, and you also know on this column, it's, just, it's not just showing you've checked LinkedIn, right? You know, you get a lot of emails where you're like, you know, hey, I saw you like going outside. I also like going outside. And therefore, that prompted me to reach out and pitch you my SaaS offering. Uh, like, like that, that may have worked great, like in 2005. Um, but like, again, you know, as we said, it's like, it's 2021. And I think people uh, get a little bit desensitized to what comes through in their inbox. So it's how do you stand out from there? Yeah, yeah. Well, so, so here's a question then. Um, personalization sounds like it takes some effort and time. Like you actually have to spend the, the time to get to know at least your prospects, industry, business, and maybe them as a person. Um, does that mean that personalization is only good for like, you know, high ACV, high contract value sales motions or ABM plays? I'll take anybody who wants to jump on that one. I, so so I, I think... Um you really got to prioritize, right? There's only so much time in the day. Um, and you want to want to focus your, your, you know, good personalization on that high ACV targets, right? We know that. I think, um, you know, the, the lower priority ones, they deserve some, some personalization as well. And, and to me, the way you do that is by bucketing somehow, right? So bucketing by industry or bucketing by persona. So they get something that feels personalized to them in their role. Um, but it might not have those elements that are like directly related to them. Um, and, and with tools like outreach that, that we use, uh, we can start seeing if, if it's resonating and they're like, they're clicking or, or opening up the content or whatever. And then you strike with that really highly personalized, uh, outreach. So, so it's kind of a layered approach. Um, but it's all about time. And, and, and that's one of, one of those really limiting factors. Um, I'd like to add something to it. It also depends on <clears throat> how big you are, how big your brand is. Like I've been at companies where we were really small and and when SDRs were sending big mass blasting emails, they were not getting results because no one knew the brand. It was a new company in a new space. It's very different when you are an established market in the player where your total addressable market already knows you. And that's when they see an email and if they are really interested and the timing is right, they'll probably respond. So it also depends on where you are in your journey, how big of a brand it is, how well known of a player you're in the market. Mm, that's a good point. There's a, there's a great question that came up in the chat, uh, from Gary Herman. Some good debate going on about it too. But so Gary's question is, what's a reasonable amount of time for an SDR to spend on research for let's say let's say there's a range like Corey on your team, what do you expect for a high priority target versus a low priority target in terms of time investment? Yeah, so so high priority like we have um, you know like top ten targets like these are the ones that you're working for like a year right and and trying to get in any angle. Uh, I, I think you know you might spend fifteen minutes a half an hour to to highly customize an email. That is the exception, right? Uh, I'm looking for people, we, we, we try to do three by three research, find three things in three minutes, and, and then try to get an email out. So, so if, you're, if you're really good, you can maybe every five or 10 minutes get, get a personalized email out. Um, but, but I think you, you got to uh, analyze who you're going after and, and, and really, is it worth my time? If it's high ACV, worth a little more time. Any reactions to that, Alex? Yeah, I think from an ops perspective, uh, what really kind of I think was our internal silver bullet in 2020 when the world was falling down outside of our company was just getting really clear on um, prioritization. So ops owned, along with our marketing leadership, like pretty much cutting up our entire addressable market into tiers. So we could really clearly say, this is an account that we feel is right in the center of our TAM or right in the center of our ICP bullseye. And let's focus on those. So I think first things first, if you have you know, a bigger team that's going after lots of accounts, it's figuring out that like not all accounts are created equal. Not every company is exactly the same. 
Uh, and they're different, maybe if you're doing tiers or if you're cutting it up in a different way, understanding that like, hey, maybe a tier one account automatically doesn't get a certain approach. It automatically is going to get, you know, that like, hey, these aren't going outreach, at least in, in a, you know, templatized, uh, more, you know, volume based approach. Um, and I think from, from an ops perspective, we take on a lot of burden in a good way. Uh, which is to make sure that our database is enriched, that our team like has a lot of these data points at their fingertips. They're not trying to figure out like, okay, where should I start? Like, you know, my ideal situation is we have SDRs that come in in the morning and they can sit down and like pull up a list of accounts and say, these are the top ones I'm hitting to start. These are the ones I need to get out the door before 10 a.m. this morning. And these are the ones that, you know, we can work on maybe just making sure that there's intense signals and stuff that were bubbling and we can take a different approach there. Um, but from, from ops perspective, from my ops lens, uh, it's saying, can we make sure that our team doesn't just trip over our own feet when we try to understand what are the accounts that we should be treating differently than the next? Uh, and I think, um, you know, you don't necessarily need a full blown ops team to be able to do these types of segmentation, like, you know, working with sales leadership to understand like, hey, pick your top 100 accounts and all of a sudden that's tier one and everything else is tier two is a great way to start. So, um, you know, I, I think too, like not even necessarily in uh, to kind of pivot a little bit, um, you know, who, where do you need to do personalization? I think like it's such a valuable skill to learn regardless of what role you're in. Like when I have to try to ask for resources or headcount or something elsewhere in our business, like I'm sending personalization emails to my CRO. Like I think that's a kind of thing that, um, you know, if you get good at that, I think that opens up a lot of doors for you in various career pathways. If, you know, sales is obviously a phenomenal one, but, uh, you know, it, it's a skill that's saying like, how do you appeal to the person you're trying to convince? Um, and like, you know, me even in ops, I'm trying to do that every day. Yeah, you know, that's an interesting point. And that is actually a great transition because we've got a couple questions about LinkedIn in the chat. And by the way, everybody's submitting amazing questions. I'm going to try to get to as many of them as possible. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about LinkedIn. And then we're going to talk a little bit about tech stacks in general. So far, most of our conversation, I think, has sort of implied they were talking about personalization and emails. Um, who pointed out, Christine Harvey pointed out that um, sometimes LinkedIn isn't the best place. It's, you know, you see those like people kind of getting pissed about the connect and pitch kind of thing on LinkedIn. And then Bob Homier um, pointed out as well that sometimes somebody's LinkedIn profile doesn't leave you much to go on. Um, Corey, for you, any like alternatives to LinkedIn uh, for personalization or any tips for using LinkedIn to reach out? Yeah. So, so first off, just talking about like the approach to LinkedIn, it's, it's, it's a social network and just think about social interactions, right? You can't come in too hot and heavy, right? So I, I see LinkedIn as, as a slower play, right? So it's a connection and then maybe it's a, it's a profile view a little bit later. Then you find an article and you like that. Um, people buy from people who like them. So it's it's very fundamental. So if you're liking their 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 what they're posting on LinkedIn, uh, that gets your name on their radar. So when the phone call comes in or that next email comes in, they may answer. And then after a while, maybe maybe a week or two of doing this, go in for the ask, right? So mm -hmm. so it's not as immediate. Like the phone is the best way to get a meeting now. LinkedIn is a good way to get a meeting in the near future. That's kind of the way I I, I think about. LinkedIn. Yeah, I agree. Um, fun fact about LinkedIn is that I, I have used it for a variety of purposes, recruiting, trying to find contributors, guests for webinars. I make all kinds of asks. And um, I was banging my head against the wall until I finally realized that I should just be kind of making friends with people in the areas where I would have to eventually make asks. And that's why, like... Now I just have friends and we do things that are to get together that are fun for everybody. Um, but obviously it took really, it took two years. So, you know, not everybody can take that approach. Um, cool. Really great questions, y'all. Uh, let's talk a little bit about tech stacks because I think that's an appropriate kind of transition. So we're talking about LinkedIn. We're talking about, Corey, you mentioned outreach. There's other kinds of email platforms you can use. Alex, can you just run us through what's in, what do you consider part of your personalization slash maybe relevance tech stack? Yeah, so uh, we made a big investment in, last year, which um, was awesome. 
uh, in an ABM orchestration tool called Six Sense. So we're big fans of Six Sense uh, at Sendoso. Um, and what Six Sense does for us is it helps score up our database based on pull up any given account in Salesforce, understand like, is it a strong fit for Sendoso based on, you know, a data algorithm that, that we work with them to provide. Uh, but then also it pulls up uh, intent scores. So what that means is uh, based on, there are many uh, ABM and intent vendors out there. Uh, Six Sense is just one of, of many and one that we just happen to be big fans of. But uh, what Six Sense does is it can infer, you know, where in a buying cycle they think a company is. So they're like, hey, you know, they're doing a lot of intent on your website. They're interacting with some of your sales emails. Um, we believe that these people are in fact in market. Like that's a great opportunity to make sure that you get the right messaging uh, in front of somebody. So when I think of like personalization and prioritization, it kind of starts with a lot of the data we get off of, you know, a demographic identification of who is our ICP and then also a behavioral identification of, well, who's doing interesting things within our ICP that, you know, presumably lead to a uh, more easily converted meeting. Um, but as part of uh, the rest of the stack, though, of course, there's a lot more there. Um, we're a big fan of outreach. Of course, that gives us, um, you know, multiple different ways of AB, AB testing different things, um, multi-channel approaches where I know we talk about LinkedIn, where you're not only going through email and that really kind of project manages a lot of our SDR team's days, if you will. Um, we're big fans of direct mail. It uh, shouldn't have come as a surprise, but, uh, you know, we do a lot of work on, you know, putting together really um, unique sends ourselves. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, our own prospects that we work with, you know, they're looking at us like, hey, you know, so no, so we've never actually tried direct mail before. So we try to lead by example. Uh, we actually have an internal uh, role whose pure job it is, is to essentially be Sendoso for Sendoso so that we can cleanly set things up, track them, measure them, and also turn what we found to be successful back out to our prospects and customers. Um, so really cool things there that we've, you know, it's part of the perks, I guess, of working within uh, direct mail is, is, is having, um, you know, a bunch of customers and things to experiment with. We're big fans of Sales Navigator. I think um, we found that, you know, there's a lot of different mediums of which you can get in front of people. And LinkedIn is definitely more of a greenfield inbox than maybe an email inbox. And I think, uh, you know, diversity and, and diversification, how you do outreach is definitely a key to getting a lot of good conversions. And our team's actually been pretty successful in using LinkedIn just because I think there's a lot of thought content or thought leadership content that you can kind of be a part of and you swirl around until you find the right moment to make uh, the right relevant ask. Um, but more in an ops perspective, like I mentioned earlier, we take on a lot of the kind of enrichment burden of making sure that our team has clean data in our CRM that they can go after. Uh, so we made some big investments in like Clearbit, um, also like EverString and ZoomInfo, just to make sure that, you know, we're not putting uh, kind of that research burden, at least at the at the super surface level data points, uh, back out on our team. So we like to think that's at least a starting point for saying, who should we be going after? What should we say? And, um, you know, that's a good starting point to say, okay, we've got 80% of what you need. Now, maybe you need to go search for that last 20%. But, uh, you know, of course, we have a lot of tools um, that we're always looking at. I think that's part of uh, the fun parts about being in RevOps is being able to evaluate new stuff out there that is unique. I think there's a ton of cool stuff that's happening with video. There's a ton of cool things that are happening with like experiences. Um, you know, just back to saying like the way we did it in 2005 is uh, long, long in the rearview mirror. Uh, and if you're not experimenting with new things today, then um, you know, your competitors probably are. So lots of cool stuff out there. Like I'm a tools nerd when it comes to that kind of stuff. So always love to, I could talk for the rest of the time. I just that and that alone. So, uh, but I'll pass off to these guys. seems like we might have a couple other tools nerds in the chat. So uh, yeah. thanks for the tips, y'all. There's, there's some cool chat going on there. Corey. Um, yeah. Let's jump to you. What is your personalization slash like relevance tech stack look like? How does it work for you? Yeah, so so Alex mentioned a bunch that we're using as well. Six Sense um, is is really key for us. Um, just taking like keywords they're searching and tailoring messaging to them because you know that's top of mind um, is, is one. Zoom Info they have a cool little um, section called Scoops just that that aggregates kind of news data that that uh, we use all the time. LinkedIn uh, Navigator is probably where we get most of our info. Um, we've gotten a lot. I'm not just saying it because Alex is here. Sendoso has been huge for us in 2020 and in 2021. We've leaned heavily on it. Um, there's a lot of fun things you can do by sending direct mail, um, but uh, just a, just a really great tool. Uh, a couple other things we use. Um, there's there's a, a company called Follows, and they, there's Follows boards. So that is um, just a tailored landing page for people. 
Uh, and you can also kind of, uh, it knows where they're coming from. So you can put the company logo in the corner. So, so if someone lands in there like, oh my God, this content's like perfectly for me, my logo. So it really feels like a, like a personalized experience. Um, we, we've just piloted a couple tools. So I, so I hesitate mentioning them, but I, I will just because I know people are interested. Uh, User Gems is, is an organization that finds out where um, people have worked previously um, and, and uh, like of your current customers and where they've landed now. So just referencing, hey, we've worked with you in the past. Let's, let's uh, connect now. Um, and then there's this new one that's very new to us, truepartner.io. It's a, it's a scraping tool. So it can tell you information about education, um, you know, like, act, like people that are following on social media, like actors, comedians, um, musicians, uh, you know, reality TV stars, like if the company's got funding, all that good stuff. So it, um, it just gives you a lot to work with. We're, we're really early with it. So I, I, I can't tell you all these great results, but in, in theory, it sounds like, a, like a, a great way for us to really customize messaging to, to people. Well, there's some cool things that I was writing down in there because I've never heard of, but I'm going to look into a couple of those. Uh, all right, Appy, tell us about your stack. What's in your tech stack? Outreach. We've heard about outreach from Alex and Corey both. Sendoso, again, have used it tremendously in 2020 with the address confirmation feature, big part of our pipeline gen. <clears throat> user gems, we used user gems. Um, worked well. Zoom info. We recently signed up for the advanced version of Zoom Info. So earlier, I think it was Ryan who was saying we're not able to find mobile numbers. Not sure, Ryan, if you have the updated version where you can get, you need to pay more for that. But my team is getting a lot of connects after we upgraded with, to the advanced version of Zoom Info. Um, we, similar to follow Corey, uh, we recently signed up with a tool called Mutiny. It personalizes the landing page and, you know, you can have the prospect's name, prospect's company or persona type, uh, starting to use that. Um, Gong for call recording, analyzing calls, giving feedback to our entire SDR team as well as sales reps. Um, that's how my tech stack looks like. Cool. Um, there are almost so many questions. I don't know where to go yet. Let's... <laughs> Well, let's have some fun. So when we were prepping earlier, um, we were talking about some of the like specific plays. And I always, part of me hesitates to do this because I know if we share the specific plays, everybody here is going to want to go do that play and then it's going to be tired. So if you feel like retiring one of your plays <laughs> um, or you just don't mind telling everybody about it, can you share something like a specific play for personalization that's worked well for you? Can we start with you, Appy? Yeah, I tried a couple of things recently. Um, I'll share the first. We started, I started a spiff going on with the SDR team, uh, the most personalized email of the week and started compensating SDRs on that. And to, to keep it clean, um, there's a tool we use called Cold Email Creator. For anyone who doesn't know, it's, it's powered by Sales Hacker and Outreach. So what you basically need to do, you just need to enter the seniority level of the prospect. Let's say they are a VP or director or manager. Add your subject line and add your content, email content, and it will grade your email out of 100. Let's say it will give your score 85, 95, and it will break down the details. So I started using this most personalized email of the week using cold email grader that helped us motivate the team to do personalization and got us some really good uh, emails and subject lines. Other than just spiffing uh, the SDRs and having them send personalized emails, now I have a record, a whole database of the best emails that I can share with my new hires. Mm. So that worked really well. We're still continuing that. So um, I would highly encourage the SDR leaders to do that. You also mentioned to me that you're experimenting with Cameo. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, um, from January, what we did was I got the team's motivation. Uh, they were ready to start using Cameo. And we decided every SDR is going to send two Cameos per month 
I gave them a budget of um, four hundred dollars for just sending two cameos. It was uh, they had to exercise that part of the brain where you know it's the first time you're doing something. How do I do my research? What do I send? What should I send to the celebrity to ask and uh, say to the prospect? So initially, LinkedIn was not a great tool to find. You know who who do prospects follow? So that transitioned us from uh, LinkedIn to Twitter. Twitter was a great place to find what people follow, uh, who do they like, what kind of celebrities, athletes, prospects, entertainers, and uh, yeah, every SDR started sending two cameos per month, um, and within a span of three months, we had a ton of tracking going on with cameo. So good success. Um, it's a great tool. We were using Sendoso integration with cameo, and it worked really well. We'll probably continue. Uh, but this is something we just started doing in 2021, and I'm excited that the SDR world is developing and becoming more and more personalized. Cameo is a fun one. I, I, I still am waiting to receive my first cameo. Maybe my budget isn't big enough yet. I'll get you one, Colin. <laughs> uh, we're huge fans of Cameo at Sendoso, and it actually works incredibly well in all parts of your funnel. Um, I think, uh, you know, Appy, you know, mentioned, like, if you want to go get someone who's, like, a really A-list celebrity, it can be pretty expensive, um, but it's a perfect tool uh, for helping with, like, you know, hey, what are your top 10 accounts you're trying to penetrate and if you can find something really unique. Uh, I know that it works great. We found um, for our own internal selling, uh, you know, if you have to spend a little more money and you have a deal close to the finish line, uh, that's a phenomenal way of kind of at least uh, injecting what can, what can be sometimes a really rough part of the sales process. We're like going through legal and procurement. It's just like the very, let's say, um, the less human parts of the sales process. So injecting a cameo later in those processes is really cool. I think, um, you know, a fan favorite just to like illustrate kind of some of the cool things you can do with cameo. A uh, fan favorite across the Sendoso team is Mark McGrath, who's the, the lead singer of the band Sugar Ray. So if you have like a, a prospect um, and you want to send him a cameo, if you get Mark McGrath and you send a cameo with Mark McGrath, he'll literally get on his guitar and sing a song to your prospect uh, on the spot about like why they should take that meeting with you. So it's super cool. Again, back to what is personalization. It's establishing that human connection. Like, I don't know if, if Mark McGrath sang me a song on my computer, like, I, I at least give someone a response, you know, some sort of uh, illicit human response there. So uh, lots of really cool, unique things going out there in video, Cameo just being one of them. Yeah, we've we've used Cameo a, a bunch as well. And, and, and a couple couple cool things we've done was that the marketing department uh, thought it would be cool to, to have uh, um, uh, Brian Bumgarner, Kevin from, from The Office, uh, just, just do like a, a little comedy bit about accounts payable and and it was it was hilarious he's talking about losing checks and 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 you know just stuff that would resonate with our personas uh and um so so we've used that as like a, a differentiator just rising above the noise you know there's a, all these other people reaching out so that's just something a little different to get on the radar um we had one where we did a really specific one uh there was a company uh, dapper labs uh they they um do, they specialize like NFTs, you know, like digital art. Um, and uh, there's a bunch of big NBA stars that invested in this, like Michael Jordan. So we had LeVar Ball uh, do a, a, a cameo and we sent it to him. It was by far the most entertaining cameo that, that we've ever had. Uh, so, you know, it, it is a really good tool. You know, like I think the SDR role is to, to rise above the noise. Uh, and it's a really good tool to do that. Corey, I, I forget if it was you or Alex. Somebody mentioned a tool that you used to figure out who your prospects follow. Yeah, yeah. Tr what, what uh, that? True, truepartner.io. Truepartner.io. That's for you, Christine. <laughs> Great question. Um, well, we've got like an amazing list of questions that I can get to here. Uh, so let's go with let's go with this one. Um, because I think this is like a meaty topic. This one's from Mitchell. So we've talked about relevance and that's like kind of the personalization plus. Like personalization might be table stakes. Relevance is really what's going to get you a meeting and a deal. Um, but how do you do both without coming across as creepy is a question. So like 
you know, we, we, we know you don't want to go, uh, Hey, Corey, I know you went to Yukon and, uh, you just searched for my website two days ago. It sounds, it seems like we should talk cause I went to Yukon too. And I work at the, you know, so how do you do it? Not creepily. One of my, my tip is you, you never let them know how you got that info. You, you like, if you're reaching out and it's just like kind of low intent stuff and it's like, Hey, I saw you downloaded this ebook. Like that never works. Um, so, so you, what was that ebook about? And, and mention that in the outreach, right? So, um, you know, um, you know, for, for my company, you know, we do a lot with like international payments, right? So, um, you know, I, I would reach out, hey, you know, we, we work with organizations that help people with, you know, wire transfers and ACH or whatever. So, so kind of beating around the bush a little bit, but then they're like, oh my God, that, you know, and I do this with the um, uh, Sixth Sense all the time, the keyword searches. It's like, oh, this is perfect timing. I was just looking into that stuff. And I'm like, what a coincidence, right? Um, so, so if you don't spell out how you got that info, uh, that really helps you. It's just, it just seems more of a coincidence than someone like been big brother kind of monitoring what's going on. Any other tips there, Alex, especially in like, when we're talking about direct mail, does that, does anybody ever get creeped out by direct mail or receiving packages through Sendoza? You know, I think one of the big things that we had to pivot uh, our product strategy on last year was like, well, how do you send something to somebody who's maybe not in an office? Um, and you know, obviously like sometimes you don't want people that maybe are trying to prospect to you to have access to like where you actually live. Um, so we put a lot of thought into, um, you know, we have like an address verification thing point being it's like, Hey, you should feel comfortable sharing this because it's actually not getting passed back over to us. Um, but I think, it, you know, kind of just in the spirit of anytime you're trying a new, um, strategy, like it's worth experimenting and it's not like. Everybody, not everybody's going to love it. Some people are that you might not think love it. Find out being like they're you know absolutely ecstatic to get something in the mail. Um, but I think that you know gifting is just in, in the physical direct mail is just one part of it. You know, there's much more low hanging fruit if you want to send you gift cards, things like that. But um, you know, I think it just comes back to the idea of try it, see what works. If there's a certain profile of folks that maybe aren't as receptive to it or it's not working, um, you know. You know, I would be remiss in my ops role to not say always be measuring um, and always be tracking and always be iterating. So, you know, I think it, it's worth a try. Like there's a lot of really easy kind of ways to test it. Um, but definitely like, you know, same way sending in mails to people. Like some people love it and they're really receptive. Some people are like, you know, my in, my LinkedIn in mail inbox is sacred. And how dare you bring that your your pitch over to me? Um, so, you know, not a one size fits all. And definitely, like I said, experimentation and Always be measuring, always be iterating. What about, so we were talking about relevance plus personalization earlier. Does that mean you're, uh, tar like, what you, are you pri or prioritizing on timing first, like people who are showing interest in Sixth Sense now and then personalizing? Or are you kind of, how does it go? This is one of my favorite things. Um, so I think when you look at kind of the demographic score of an account, just say, hey, is it a strong, moderate, or weak fit? And then you also look at the um, you know, intent they're giving. It's essentially a matrix. So what's fun about that is you're going to have people, if you want to look at a four quadrant uh, map, like in the top left, that's high intent and also strong fit. Like you're probably already going after those accounts, let's be honest. But where things get interesting is when you start looking at the fringes, which are like, hey, like these accounts are ones that we actually wouldn't consider to be a good fit for us just based on like, maybe they're in a weird industry, but they kind of do everything else. Uh, maybe aside mm -hmm. from the industry they're in, and they're doing a lot of intent. I think that's a really cool opportunity to like try new things. Cause it's like, hey, maybe we're selling to, maybe this happens to be a more forward thinking garage door company that doesn't normally like function like other garage door companies. Uh, and there's an opportunity there to get out in front of them. But I think what's also interesting is the inverse of that, where you have really strong fit companies that are showing almost no intent. And that's a very different type of play because you're obviously creating some urgency from the get go. Um, and obviously, you know, part of uh, prioritizing is also knowing where to not spend your time. And if it's like low fit, no intent, like, you know, hey, maybe there's a marketing play you can run there to soften that type of uh, database up. But, you know, when we look at how do these two data points uh, merge with each other, um, it, it's incredibly important to see like, you know, just because it's not a good fit and there's intent is actually a pretty good opportunity to open up a good part of your database that if you're only doing purely some sort of tiering structure or prioritization, 
you're going to miss uh, that entire mm-hmm. part of it. So it's something that, again, like we're always measuring and iterating, like do we have different win rates, whether or not the fit was a certain point at the time we opened the opportunity. So, but it is something that, uh, you know, is again, experiment with it, try it. And um, it, it, when you have this data, sometimes it takes a quarter or two of front end cycles through it to really understand like how to leverage it like internally. Um, and it's been something, it took us about two quarters with six cents to really feel like we really had it fine tuned where it knew what we were going after. And we actually had the sales results to prove that, yes, like we thought that this was where we should spend our time. We did it. And we actually saw maybe elevated win rates across our industries, things like that. Um, so it's something that like, if you, you don't need like a necessarily a big ops team to be able to do that either. If you have, you know, sales management, that's just looking at where is our, our pipeline coming from and how is it entering our pipeline? Uh, you'll find a lot of really unique uh, trends that pop off the page there. Cool. Uh, thanks for that. So uh, a little bit of a pivot. Um, Gary Herman brought up another great question. Thanks, Gary. So let's say you do some research as step one of a sequence. And then you send a personalized email. And then it's like three or four days later. And your step is to call them. How are you as an SDR remembering the research that you did five days ago and making that call feel personal again? What's the, you know, is there, I don't know if it's a tech solution or, or what? Any ideas there? Um, I, I, I mean, we all use outreach, but a very interesting feature on outreach is their custom fields. They give an option of 35 custom fields. Uh, that can be synced well with Salesforce. So I have SDRs, what they do, instead of doing this research again and again, they like to do this research once, put it on the prospect profile on Outreach, and it will appear on the prospect page on Outreach whenever they make the call. And I have been in different organizations with SDR teams. SDR teams, not a lot of them use these many fields, but I'd highly encourage to explore the custom fields on outreach. They could make a big difference to um, how effective you can be, how personalized you can be, and how fast you can do your outreach. So that's kind of a tech solution to it. Yeah, and we do a very, very similar thing. Um, you can throw the notes within outreach, um, but but also just reread the email before you make the call. That I mean, the research there, your, your pitch is there. Um, so, so that's what, um, you know, my team does. They, they make that highly customized email. Uh, and then when they follow up with a call, they, 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 you know, have, you know, Gmail up, read that, you know, search for the person, read it and, um, and then, uh, follow that, that similar messaging. Alex, I'm sure. I, so, oh, sorry, Abby, go ahead. I came across a crazy SDR, really awesome, who did a great job. They used to maintain their own Google sheet with prospect name and the three things they did research and they're going to talk about the phone on the phone and they'll have that uh, google sheet open on half of the screen and on the other half they'll keep continue to make they'll continue to make phone calls and they'll record those three things again and again whenever they call so they didn't have to do that research again it was manual but it helped them be on top of it and they were really good on closing meetings on the phone a fan favorite of our teams is a new tool called Scratchpad. And pretty much what that is, it's kind of like what you described, Appy. It's like a grid view that pulls in all of your opportunity data or contact data or account data and lets you like make super quick uh, notes in there and it syncs all that back to Salesforce. The premise being there is it's like, yes, you want kind of a really quick list of like what we've said before, some quick notes, data points. And at least in a tech solution like that, it syncs a lot of that stuff back to Salesforce, which if you are using outreach and you're logging stuff in custom fields there, uh, that can pull all the way up into a tool like Scratchpad, even by way of Salesforce. So there are some cool technology solutions out there, but I think in general, it's just like, just pause right before you do this. Like think of like the 30 seconds worth of bullet points you want to have in your brain before you get in front of that person. Uh, and like that time investment's worth it if it means that you get one or two extra connects. So part of it's like, you know, people want to move fast, of course, but, uh, you know, of course, like taking that quick pause for 10 seconds to collect your three bullet points before you hit dial um, always goes a long way. We've talked a lot about uh, like words that you can say or write, but there's a whole other dimension here that I was just thinking about, you know, as you guys were telling stories of cool plays that you've done and seen, I was thinking about the 
like outreach the prospecting that I've received as a prospect. And the first thing that comes to mind is really like the most memorable thing is, uh, uh, I think it was Drift sent me a pinata once. And it was just like filled with candy and a nice note because of something that I, I did with them. Um, like that's memorable. And it also makes me think, like that's, I'm just going to carry that impression with me forward forever. Drift is my fave. That was great. Um, so when we think about picking objects, right. Or like things to send somebody, Alex, yeah, that goes beyond deciding what to say. How do you do that? How do you decide what you're sending? Yeah. And this is always a fun one. And I think, uh, one of my more, I guess, favorite parts selfishly about working at Sonoso is seeing all the really cool things that other customers and other companies do. Um, I think, you know, one of my own favorite things, like I sit in my living room right now. Um, one of the cool things is like the little small stuff you wouldn't think about, like sending a succulent that you can sit in your desk. Mm. Uh, it's those types of things that are like, whoa, that's unique. Like, you know, I wouldn't expect, uh, you know, I wouldn't, I didn't expect the succulent to show up. And now I have this really cool green succulent that sits on my desk. Um, so things like that, like the pinatas are always interesting. It, there's things that uh, like don't, and oftentimes even equate it all back to the brand that's selling it, but it's memorable. I think that's what's so unique. Um, I remember one of my actually favorite customer campaigns was one that Gong did where um, they use it for opportunities or deals that were going dark. They sent them like a little mini lantern. And so it's one of those, like it didn't even have like a lot to it. It's just say like, hey, you know, if you're lost in the dark or things are going dark, like here's a lantern. So there's always something a little humor that you can add to it. Um, but some of those little like, you know, whether it's a desk toy, uh, one of the other core things that I think um you know, is available in a direct uh, mail capacity is, is sending stuff like um, experiences. So, or direct perishable stuff like that. So a fan favorite when we were all in offices is people like to send cupcakes. And what cup, what's cool about that is it's like, are you Colin going to eat like a dozen cupcakes by yourself? If I send them to your office, probably not, at least I hope not. Uh, but what you'll probably do is you'll go put it on like a break room table somewhere and like the rest of the company will come through and they'll be like, Oh, who sent these? Um, there's always some cool, like, again, not even with the brand, it's just like the, the warm, fuzzy feelings you get about like just receiving something, um, which always go pretty far. Um, we're always trying to experiment ourselves at Sendoso, so we always have something cool up our sleeves. Like right now, we're experimenting with like sending hot sauce and stuff like that, which is pretty cool. I know uh, Chili Piper's the, the kings of sending hot sauce, but um, you know, lots of just cool things that, like I said, don't pitch your brand super hard, but give something, give someone something that makes them feel good about what they received. So everyone likes receiving stuff. Um, and then like, if you build that brand equity by having that nice recipient experience, then you have the opportunity later to make more of that, like, okay, like, you know, we feel like we know each other now. Like maybe we can have this discussion around, you know, how our two you know, groups can help each other, things like that. We've, we've had great success with the co-branded cupcakes, Alex. Uh, yeah. Partners, prospects love it when they see their brand name, their logo and Blaine's logo, and they click pictures and send it to us. Thank you so much. And they're ready to talk. Uh, they love it. And also, I mean, both of you, the, the examples you've shared are great. What I usually share with my SDR team is it's not just about the gift. It's about the whole experience you're giving. And that's why a handwritten note can go much farther than a $30 Amazon gift card. Um, a succulent on their desk can make them think about you again and again rather than you know, a $5 coffee gift card. So, so it's all about the experience, what experience you're giving to them and how memorable you make things for them compared to just throwing out a gift that they can use and forget, let's say. Mm. And, and that it's funny that you mentioned a succulent because I was just in a, in a company sales meeting and one of our sales reps uh, set a succulent to a uh, closed lost opportunity and was able to turn that around and close it uh, in, a, in a pretty short time period where we w weren't getting anything back from them. So, uh, you know, as silly as a succulent sounds, like it, it works. And, and some of the other things, um, you were talking about experiences, we, you know, we were like, hey, everyone's stuck at home, you know, they're, they're probably got the, the fam, the kids, you know, we were like, let's give them something that they can do, right? So, we would send like a movie night, right? With popcorns and, and, and different things to eat. Um, the other one that's gotten us a lot is, is just donuts. We'll send donuts to people. And it comes with a pack that like, yeah, it just comes, comes with a pack where you can actually like, you know, frost it and, and put sprinkles on it and stuff. So I think that is another like fun family activity. 
Um, so, so the, the, the little gifts, they don't seem like much, but they really do go a long way. We got to test the donut kit internally and it was a, uh, it's a good one. So I, I people love it. It's my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the cool part is like, you know, people work all day and they're like, you know, I got kids at home and if there's something they can include more than just them, they're like, man, like, you know, Tapalti sent me a donut kit and my kids loved it. Like, like who's, who's, who can say anything bad about that? Right. Yep. Um, we've got, so here's another question. Uh, I think this one's from Christine. Um, is this, is, when you're sending things, uh, is it Christine? Wait, sorry, let me back up here. You guys are talking so fast. Christine, yeah, she said she uses direct mail and video often further down the pipeline, like once she's in, in a deal, working through it. Does it also always work, or does it, does it, yeah, does the approach you take to direct mail change if you're trying to do something closer to the top of the funnel, like prospecting? Yeah, I can start with that one. Uh, I think definitely. And I think, um, you know, it's, a, it's literally as it sounds, it's a funnel, right? So at the top, you're trying to interact with more people. So oftentimes what, what you're working on is what you might consider door openers, which is like, hey, how can you do something that's, maybe it's a little less expensive, but it's something that you can send in higher volumes in order to elicit more conversations. As you move down funnel, of course, you're actually interacting with fewer people. And that's where opportunities to send maybe something more expensive um, come into play. Where you wouldn't be sent, like you probably wouldn't want your SDR team uh, sending out bottles of, of Dom to like the entirety of their, uh, top of their book that they're working through, but there are de definitely very fitting parts later in the process where, you know, it's worth sending something more expensive. And again, you know, you've earned that right as you've worked your way through, um, the sales process, but, uh, definitely has, um, different elements to it. I think that there's opportunities to send things like e-gifts that are, you know, low hanging fruit expense. They're not very expensive. They actually don't involve like sending much it can be done electronically, uh, that can open up a lot of really cool opportunities top of funnel. Uh, but then bottom of funnel and even for retention and renewals, like, you know, if you have someone who's like maybe in a sticky situation after having worked with you for the last year, like, you know, again, eliciting that human to human response where people are like, man, like my Sendoso CSM or my Topalti CSM or my blend CSM. I love them. They looking out for me. They sent donut kits. Like they're like, you know, that's a human to human interaction that we want to continue to invest with. Uh, so you can think about lots of gifting opportunities, like not just top of funnel, but it actually works phenomenal. Um, down funnel and even like I said for retention and renewals too. This is a question from uh, Jonathan that actually Appy and Corey, you might run into this. Um, so basically, Jonathan's in a regulated industry or customers are in a regulated industry and can't accept cash gifts. Um, that's something I imagine you might bump up into in your in your industries. How do you work with that? Uh, Cupcakes is a great example. We work with financial institutions where we have these clauses that you cannot send any gift that's worth more than $20 or $30. But in those cases, you can definitely send them um, cupcakes for their team where it's a perishable item. It's not a gift for any single individual. You can just have them. Um, so we use that for these kind of accounts and prospects. So it's the fortune. amount spent and the perishability that's key? Uh, yeah, and it's it's not a gift for a specific person. Um, it's, yeah, it's basically not a gift for a specific person. Understood. Yeah, sorry, Corey. No, I was just going to say, fortunately, we don't, we don't run into that too often. So. Okay. We um, found, too, if you are working with the regulated industry, one of the things that our team's tried is sending essentially charity donations. Where they're not accepting it, but they're passing it off to someone else. And it brings with it that same kind of feel good thing. Like, I can't accept this and take it myself, but I'm happy to transfer the value of this uh, to a different charitable foundation. Um, there's a lot of different vendors, you know, ourselves included, that, that work through things like that. And, um, you know, we found that that works pretty well in, in some of these places where people are hesitant to, to accept something themselves. We've noticed that when prospects are hesitant to share, their, give their address, they try to go to the charity choice route. That's a really nice play. That's like a, a heartwarming play. Um, this might be our last question here. So Bob, thanks. Uh, thanks everybody. Amazing, amazing interaction and questions. Thanks for showing up and actually acting like this is a good community event. You're not watching a YouTube video. Um, here's a question. Let's Alex, I'll, I'll let you answer this one. Is sending... Sure. 
gifts just totally up to your rep's discretion when they send it, who they send it to, or is it like part of a, a sequence, uh, part of, uh, you know, built into a playbook that they're running? Yeah, it could be both. I think, um, you know, we, as part of our own sending strategy internally, like we actually have it hooked into Marketo. So there's a lot of sending that we can actually do without a rep actually, um, you know, triggering something themselves. You know, at least part of uh, the way we operate internally is like if there's a marketing campaign that's running and someone does something or, you know, we can automatically trigger a sending event to happen in the background. But I think it's kind of like the same even idea as sending emails. There's a templated, more uh, broader approach that you can take. And when you really feel like you need to have that, like, you know, really straight shot, a one-to-one -one experience, like, you can do that as well. And I think that's part of, um, you know, we integrate with tools like Outreach, where you can integrate Sendoso Sends directly into, you know, campaigns and things you're already running, um, which I think has been a big strategy for us, right? It's like, you know, hey, there are lots of different ways that you can get in front of your prospects. And, you know, direct mail happens to be a new channel that a lot of people are experimenting with, like. We don't want that to be a, a burden to say, okay, one other tool I have to go log into. Um, but it can be both. And I think there's a, there's a right opportunity for any different type of outreach, whether you're like, here's a dozen people, I'm going to send them a slightly a different version of each email versus like, here's one person and I'm going to craft the entire thing, one of one, 100%. Uh, the same would apply to how you send things. Absolutely. Oh, beautiful. Uh, so listen, guys, I learned a lot. This was really fun. It was super cool to hear about the examples and the creative ideas that y'all are using for personalization in all different channels. Um, so if people want to connect with you or ask more questions, uh, how can they find you, Alex? LinkedIn. Uh, plus, my email is easy. I'll give it out because everyone showed up and hung out less today. Uh, I like to think I've been at Sendoso not that long, but long enough where it's just Alex at Sendoso.com. So always happy to chat with people. Cool. Thanks. And, and Appy, where can people find you? LinkedIn. LinkedIn. LinkedIn just dropped your LinkedIn in the chat. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Corey, what about you? Uh, you guys can find me on Venmo. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, LinkedIn's great. Or, or um, I, I agree with Alex. Feel free to email me at Corey.Kruger at Spalti. Awesome. And of course, you can find everybody who's a forward-thinking uh, B2B sales professional in the community at saleshacker.com. Um, since this was such a meaty discussion, I'll uh, put some of my biggest takeaways there. If y'all want to get together um, and chat about it, I'll include it in the follow-up email tomorrow so you can drop in. We can keep the discussion going. And I think instead of picking one winner of a hoodie, I'm going to have to pick at least three because so many of y'all were just amazing, amazing webinar attendees today. Thank you so much for being great members of the sales hacker community and thank you to Corey, Appy, and Alex for showing up and bringing amazing knowledge. We'll see y'all soon. Have a great day, everybody.